Hi, you're looking at a photograph of a sample of Wenlock limestone. This is a reef deposit from the Silurian period. If you look carefully at this photograph, you can see that the majority of this rock is actually made of fossil material. It's a biological sediment. But what can we see going on with those fossils there? What are they like? How many different types are there? What are actually the processes that have gone together to create this collection of fossils within the same geological unit? What I want to do today is to talk about a new idea for us in geology. It's an idea we call a fossil assemblage. For this, you'll need uh, the worksheet um, entitled Fossil Assemblages that has pictures of two collections of graptolites. Okay, let's go. The handout that you have has these two photographs on it. These particular samples um, were collected from rocks of Ordovician age at a place called Aberivy Bay, perhaps more famously known as the Blue Lagoon, in Pembrokeshire. What we have here are two assemblages of graptolites. So there's two collections of graptolite fossils that are found on the same bedding surface. So these animals clearly were preserved together. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to annotate these. I'd like you to describe the differences that you can observe between these two assemblages, between these two collection of fossils. What do you notice about them? What can you see in these specimens? Just to give you some idea, the scale bars you can see at the bottom there both show centimetre blocks. Have a go at that now. Okay. Having made your observations, let's look at a little bit of theory. There are different types of assemblage. The first we're going to look at is what we call a life assemblage. Life assemblages preserve fossils as they lived. So there's no transport of the uh, bodies after their death. The, the, uh, the fossils are just buried where and as they lived. So what do you think you'd expect to see? If you found a collection of fossils in, a, in one bed, what would a life assemblage actually look like, do you think? Well, there's a number of different features. We might see a range of species being preserved. Species don't often just live on their own. There'll be a whole community of organisms um, living in a, a particular environment that can be preserved together. There'll be a range of ages of individuals. Again, if you have uh, a, a thriving community, there's going to be mature adults, there's going to be juveniles. There'll be a full range of ages within a community. These tend to be deposited pretty rapidly, so there might not be any alignment of fossils. These things are buried as they live. And they tend as well to be uh, well preserved. There's no particular evidence uh, of erosion of any of the fossil specimens. Now, life assemblages tend to be the result of uh, a sudden event. 
what we call a mass mortality event. Uh, often catastrophic, um, for example, um, a mud flow, um, burying a community uh, on a seabed, all of a sudden, all in one go, will preserve all of the members of that community. Now, there are some things we need to watch out for um, within a fossil assemblage. This includes the idea of what we call a derived fossil. Now, a derived fossil is one that is actually derived from older rocks. So it's eroded out of an older rock, transported uh, as a clast, and then deposited with younger sediment. What would that look like? How would you recognise uh, a fossil within an assemblage that's derived? There are a few key features. Firstly, the fossil would show some signs of being eroded and transported. There'll be a loss of detail. It'll be rubbed, it'll be polished, it'll be abraded. The, uh, it may even be broken up. The fossil, remember, acts as a, a clast, as any other would. Also, the other thing that would flag up a fossil as being derived was that it didn't fit, whether that's in term of a, terms of age, or in terms of the environment in which it was um, found. I've included a couple of photos here at the bottom of this slide. This is of a, uh, a bivalve called Gryphea. You may well have found some of these yourself. Um, they're quite common fossils in the lower Jurassic. Uh, they're quite common, for example, at places like Southern Down on the uh, South Wales coast. Gryphea is a really robust shell. Very thick, very tough. It's why they make such common and good fossils. And they exclusively lived in the sea in the early Jurassic period. Now, I found fossils of Gryphea in gravels deposited by a river in the Quaternary period. You can see some photographs, uh, some sorry, specimens of that on the right-hand side. You can see that they're a bit broken. There's some detail that's been worn off them. And they don't fit within a quaternary river sediment. Clearly, these fossils are derived. They've been eroded out of Jurassic uh, limestones and redeposited in a quaternary gravel. The second type of assemblage we can find is what we call a death assemblage and this is where fossils aren't preserved in the place where they lived they've been transported after death what do you think that would look like what would you see if you're looking at a death assemblage of fossils We would see that the fossils in that assemblage are eroded, perhaps broken down, perhaps sorted out as well by size or shape. Those fossils as well might be aligned if there's a, a flow that's transporting those uh, fossils. It can align uh, them in you know, parallel to the flow. We'd see a, a, perhaps a smaller range of organisms. We'd, we'd see juveniles missing. The smaller uh, fossils may well be washed away. Uh, it may only be uh, that these fossils sort of accumulate after death. So it's perhaps more likely to be mature organisms. There may be only a limited number of um, species of fossils actually preserved. And the fossils themselves may be a bit battered and, and broken. You know, we're not going to see the, um, particularly the sort of fine detail of fossils, 
uh, preserved within the fossil, fossil assembly. This is a, a modern example of a death assemblage. You'll have seen similar things on a beach. Shells from, uh, in this case, bivalves, that are, well, separate, first of all. When a bivalve dies, uh, the shell opens up and will separate fairly uh, soon afterwards. For example, if you, uh, if you like eating mussels, you, you don't cook or eat the, the ones that are open um, when you get them out of the bag. They're dead. You don't know how long they've been dead. They, they can make you really quite poorly. These fossils as well have been broken up by the, the wave action. They're fragmental. Notice that there's a, there's a rough sorting of the size of these as well. This is um, an assemblage of, uh, of fossils, really quite, quite a beautiful specimen, uh, from Greece, from the Upper Triassic. Now these particular fossils have been interpreted as a death assemblage. What do you think about that? Would you agree with that interpretation? Perhaps a, a specimen like this shows us that we've got to think quite carefully about these assemblages. We can't just immediately jump to any one conclusion. Does this particular assemblage, for example, share some features of a life assemblage? Does it have some features of a death assemblage? Think about how these particular organisms uh, would actually have lived. What do you think? If we look at another type of uh, fossil assemblage, the one we started with from the Wenlock limestone, having looked at some of the theory behind this, what type of assemblage do you think this rock is? Is this a life assemblage? Is it a death assemblage? Is it hard to tell from this particular specimen? What do you think? Okay, let's go back to our handout. We know some more things now. We've got some more th geological theory to work with. How do you now interpret these two assemblages from, uh, from different beds in the same location? I want you to annotate these images. Perhaps use a different colored pen. How would you interpret these now? What evidence would you use to support uh, your interpretation of these particular specimens? Let me show you what I think. I think this one on the left is a life assemblage, the one on the right a death assemblage. If you look at the one on the left, there's a number of different species of graptolite in there. We can also see that there's a range of sizes of graptolites, quite a few smaller ones, some larger ones. Most of those graptolites, even though they're quite fragile, are actually complete. There's also, there's no orientation to uh, their deposition. If we contrast that with the, the specimen on the right, there's a much smaller range of sizes. I think there's far more um, fragments of fossils in the one on the right, although there are still quite a few that are uh, complete. They're roughly the same size. Or well, there's certainly a, pre, uh, a, a dominance of, of larger, perhaps older, graptolites. And crucially, there is a, there's a definite alignment of those 
um, fossils. We could even perhaps interpret the paleocurrent direction to be something like that, a, a parallel to the uh, the uh, those graptolite stipes. So, as we watch the sunset over Aberaidi Bay, we can see that um, we can go beyond just the identification of fossil types. We can start to look at collections of fossils together as uh, an assemblage. Because that collection of fossils will tell us a lot about the environment and the conditions and the processes that were occurring as those animals lived and also as they died. Now we need to apply this to look at some real data. But that's for another lesson. I'll see you then.